Imagine you're flipping a coin six times. Here are three possible results. Heads, heads, heads. Tails, tails, tails. Heads, tails, heads, tails. Tails, heads. And heads, 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 heads. Tails, heads. Which one is the most likely? What do you think? When people were asked this question in an experiment led by Daniel Kahneman and Dave Tversky, most picked this one. Heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. But according to the laws of probability, each sequence is actually equally likely. Hello lovely people, my name is Anya, I'm glad you're here, welcome. So this coin experiment works because of a cognitive bias called representativeness bias. We know that the whole point of coin tosses is that they're random, so we pick the most random looking sequence. The question was, is it likely? But our brains prefer answering the question, what is it like? We're going to be talking about a lot of experiments in this video, which I personally love that stuff, it really gets me going, but if you maybe find experimental psychology a bit boring and dry, I have done what I could to make it more appealing. Ooh, statistics, control groups. If you look up biases on YouTube, most of the videos you'll see are about how to avoid being biased. Biases that destroy you, outsmart cognitive biases, mind traps. And this does make sense. Normally when we say someone's being biased, we mean that they're being prejudiced in an unfair way. But the reality of our brain's biases is a bit more complicated. Biases, biases, I'm gonna go with biases because I've heard that more. If we look at the scientific study of cognitive biases, several things become clear. First of all, living without them is completely impossible. And in in fact, most of our decisions in daily life aren't based on ironclad logic at all. Sir, sir, no matter how many fedoras you own or how many philosophers you misunderstand, you will never be completely rational. Secondly, our biases can actually be useful to us. Scientists have even been using our rusty little vintage brains as a reference point to teach AI systems. And finally, when biases do become harmful, in my opinion, it's primarily because of external forces, systems that our brains aren't designed to deal with or individuals who knowingly exploit our biases, like politicians and marketers. In short, biases mixed bag. Does the sunk cost fallacy help me earn money? Absolutely not, very much the opposite. But does my optimism bias help me get out of bed in the morning? Yes. So I used to try and do topical backgrounds and costumes for my videos. I have since realized that I am not in fact ContraPoint, so there's absolutely no connection between this and the topic of the video. But if you do see connections, that would be an example of a bias called apophenia, which is the tendency to see patterns where there are none. Like that lady who saw Jesus in a slice of toast. Part 1. Heuristics The words bias and heuristic are often used interchangeably. But basically, the heuristic is the method, the bias is the result. Heuristics are simple rules, rules of thumb that we use to make decisions. And they work well in most circumstances, but are prone to break down in systematic ways. Those systematic breakdowns are the biases. For example, that representativeness bias with the coins is the result of the representativeness heuristic. And we use this one all the time. If A looks like B, A is likely to be B. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably not Tony Blair. But sometimes, things that walk like ducks and talk like ducks are British Prime Ministers. And that's where we're likely to make a mistake. So being biased isn't the exact same thing as being wrong. The word bias describes a tendency to be wrong in a specific way. Like for example, let's say I'm trying to answer a question. These are all the right answers, these are all the possible wrong answers, and these are all of my answers. And the bias makes all of my answers kind of shift. So these are all of my correct biased answers, and these are all of my incorrect biased answers. Mmm, Venn diagrams. 2. Availability. Psychologists Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, why well, I really cannot say Tversky without a Russian accent. Tversky. Tver anyway. Psychologists Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, the power couple of the field, describe availability like this. Individuals estimate the frequency of an event, or the likelihood of its occurrence, by the ease with which instances or associations come to mind. The easier it is to imagine or remember an event, the more likely you think it is. There's lots of factors that affect this, but two, for example, are recency and vividness. The famous example of the availability heuristic leading to bias is the way people are way more afraid of shark attacks than they logically should be. Apparently 51% of Americans say they're absolutely terrified of sharks, and 38% say that sharks make them afraid to swim in the ocean. Meanwhile, apparently, you're twice as likely to die from a vending machine falling on you than from a shark. Think twice about shaking a vending machine next time your Twix gets stuck. And look, 
Of course, the idea of being attacked by a shark is absolutely terrifying. It's a primordial fear. But there's an interesting cycle here that happens that's connected to the availability heuristic. Because the shark attack is so vivid, we have lots of media that focuses on shark attacks. The media makes the shark attacks even more vivid. Also, anytime a real shark dares show its face anywhere near humans swimming, the media will immediately cover it, even if the shark didn't attack anybody. It's a smear campaign. And because of this kind of news, the idea of a shark attack also becomes more recent in people's minds. Recency and vividness equals more availability. Equals, this event is very likely to happen. One experiment that Kahneman and Tversky did to illustrate the availability heuristic is this. They gave a group of people a list. In this list were the names of 19 celebrity men and 20 B-list celebrity women. They take the list away, they ask, were there more men or women in the list? And people overwhelmingly said that there were more men. Because the male celebrities were more famous, they could simply remember the men's names better, the names were more available, and so people overestimated the number of men in the list. And then of course they swapped the genders to make sure that the issue isn't simply that people remember men more. Part 3. Anchoring. Anchoring. This is another Tversky and Kahneman one, the Beyonce and Jay-Z of cognitive science. Sometimes when you're making a decision, one piece of information affects your decision way more than it should, like a heavy anchor. People often say that it's the first piece of information you receive, but that's actually not necessarily the case. Anchoring is often used in sales. For example, is, is this sweater worth $50? I don't know. I mean, do I even need another sweater? But wait, it's on sale and it used to be worth $150. And all of a sudden, my hands are sweating and I'm running towards the cash register. Here's an experiment Kahneman and Tversky came up with to demonstrate anchoring bias. They asked their sample group, what percentage of African countries is in the United Nations? But there were two steps to answering this question. First, their subjects had to spin a wheel, like a wheel of fortune type wheel, and get a random number. Then they were asked, do you think the percentage of African countries in the UN is higher or lower than the number you got from the wheel. And only after they answered that first question, they were asked, what exact percentage do you think is the right answer? Here's how Kahneman and Tversky described the results. The median estimate for subjects whose starting point was 10 was 25%. Well, the median estimate for subjects whose starting point was 45 was 65%. Again, this sounds like whatever, but it's actually fascinating. Because these people knew that the number they got was completely random. And without realizing it at all, they let that number significantly affect their answer. I mean, it's wild if you think about it. Mmm, medians and averages are different. Part 4, frugality. So the experiments we looked at were focused on proving the existence of biases and heuristics. The next step is explaining why they exist. It turns out there's a lot of evidence supporting the idea that our biases aren't actually flaws in our reasoning, that they're a feature, not a bug. The first explanation is that being slightly simple-minded in this way saves a lot of time and energy. Every day we make hundreds of choices and judgments. Will I make that train if I run? Is this shirt clean enough to wear to work? If we stop to actually tease out the exact probabilities to answer these questions, life would be impossible. Each of these questions involves hundreds of variables. Will the bus be in? Does it smell? Are the stains in visible places? How bright are the lights? Is there an accessory that can cover it? What are the other tops I can wear? Do I have time to wash it? That's not a real-life example, but frankly it could be. Stopping to really tease out the probabilities of each of these questions would be first of all impossible and second of all not worth it. If you did live like that, you'd end up like the beautiful mind guy calculating the velocity of pigeons and stuff. In fact, there's case studies of people who, because of brain damage, stopped being able to use heuristics and whose lives became just completely impossible. They couldn't make decisions. So instead we rely on heuristics and these heuristics, even though they're so simple, sometimes work surprisingly well. For example, psychologist Goldstein and Gigerenzer ran an experiment to show how well the recognition heuristic works. They ask a group of German students, which city do you think is bigger, San Antonio or San Diego, by population? Now, the German students don't really know much about either of these cities, so most of them answer San Diego because at least they've heard of San Diego. Then a group of American students is asked the same question. The American students know a lot more about San Diego and San Antonio, so their algorithm of coming to a decision is much more complicated. They include more factors. And guess which group got the correct answer more often? The German students. It turned out that their one-factor decision-making strategy actually worked really well. Mmm, decision tree structures. In fact, Gigerenzer has spoken a lot about his work helping scientists improve the way AI systems come to make decisions. We have seen that complex algorithms don't do better than very simple algorithms. That's what human intelligence 
relies on. So one of the miracles of human intelligence is to know what to ignore. Gigrenzer compares an algorithm Google came up with to predict the flu with an algorithm he and his colleagues came up with. Google flu trends used millions of surge terms and over 40 variables to build various predictive models and figure out which one works best. Gigrenzer and his colleagues used a single factor model. How many doctor visits that were related to flu happened in one week? And only that information was used to predict the next weeks. And apparently the results were great. These simple algorithms motivated by psychological research predict the flu much better than big data. It turns out that in situations with high uncertainty, our clunky little brains are very, very good at making decisions. Part 5. Error Management Evolutionary psychologists thought, since these biases of ours are such a persistent trait, they must have developed for a reason. I gotta say, personally, I find evolutionary psychology very comforting, because its entire philosophy is basically everything happens for a reason. Ironically, kind of similar to religion. So, I can go around telling myself that the fact that I cannot pass my driver's test, no matter how many times I try, or that my eyebrows sweat a weird amount, are actually fitness-conducive traits essential to my survival. Anyway, evolutionary psychologists believe that some of our biases are beneficial to us because of something they call error management. We favor decisions that bring about low-cost errors. Here are two examples. Sexual overperception in men and commitment skepticism in women. Sidebar, I really enjoy when dull scientific papers end up sounding like TikTok dating coaches. Sexual overperception. Men tend tend to overestimate women's sexual interest in them because if they shoot their shot and they're rejected, big deal, move on. However, if there's a woman who is interested in them and they don't shoot their shot, that means they missed out on a chance of spreading their genes everywhere. Ironically, evolutionary psychology sounds very unevolved from a progressive viewpoint, but that's a topic for an entire different video. Also, this only applies to straight relationships because in general, I feel like queer relationships just haven't been studied enough at all. Commitment skepticism. This one's kind of the opposite of sexual overperception. Apparently, women tend to underestimate how willing men are to commit because if you think that a man is unwilling to commit when he actually is, big deal. Maybe the relationship will start a bit later or maybe it'll be a different guy. That's a low-cost error. However, if you think a man is willing to commit and he isn't, then you might be left with a child that you have to take care of on your own which is a much higher cost error. Again, it sounds super unevolved. Sorry. Although I will say, personally, I have not noticed any commitment skepticism in myself, but maybe that's because I live in New York City where it's impossible to underperceive commitment because it is just not a thing. And just in general, New York is a city that seems to have completely freed itself from the shackles of evolution. <laughs> Finally, the last example of error management I'm going to bring up, my favorite one, positive biases in self-judgment. This is a whole cluster of biases that make us think that things are better than they are. There's optimism bias, the belief that the future will be much better than the past and present. Self-evaluation bias, that idea that we're better than we actually are at things. There was that endearing study where everyone rated themselves above average at driving, which statistically is completely impossible, obviously. There's also the control illusion, the belief that we have way more control over our environment and actions than we actually do. And the IKEA effect. A group of people were asked to assemble IKEA closets. Eight hours later, having made it, they were asked, how much do you think this closet should cost? And then another group of people were just presented with the closet already collected and asked, how much do you think it should cost? And of course, the people who had spent hours toiling away at this closet really, really overvalued its price because they put so much work into it. You know, there's a Russian idiom that people often use in reference to to disappointing boyfriends, plochinki the svoy, which means he's not great, but he's mine. Anyway, this bias cluster is kind of wonderful, right? Because it makes you want to try things. I'm a huge fan of anything that makes living inside my own head a bit easier, and all of these biases really help. If you try something because you have hope that you'll succeed, even if your chances are low, there's a small chance that you'll succeed. But if you never try at all, obviously the chances of success are zero. Um, a notable exception, though, is if people are clinically depressed, their biases tend to go in the opposite direction. In conclusion, a psychologist cosmetic medicine to be put it, despite widespread claims to the contrary, the human mind is not worse than rational, but may often be better than rational. Part 6. Exploitation As I mentioned earlier, cognitive biases often get framed as a weakness we need to get rid of. Hack your mind. Become a fully optimized Cartesian overmensch. And I get that this is a very sellable angle, of course we want to become better. And it's true that even though heuristics and biases are first of all very difficult to get rid of, and secondly very useful, of course they do cause us to make mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes are very 
very harmful. Confirmation bias can make an anti-vaxxer dismiss the many convincing studies that disprove the link between autism and vaccines. What do we want? Measles. When do we want it? Now! The gambler's fallacy can make a gambler think that just because she lost 17 times in a row, means a win is definitely coming soon. And apophenia might make us see religious figures in baked goods. But I don't really want to cover all of these mistakes in too much detail because they have been discussed so much elsewhere. There is one thing I do want to point out. The difference between mistakes that arise from biases and other mistakes is that these biased mistakes are very predictable. It's like, let's say you're trying to catch a criminal driving away from a bank heist. If you don't know which way the criminal is going, you'd have to be monitoring the entire city. But if you do know ahead of time what the escape route is, you just need one cop car to catch the criminal. So mistakes that are driven by cognitive biases are predictable and therefore easy to exploit. All of that to say, it's important to understand that the harm that's caused by heuristics and biases, the responsibility isn't all on our little subjective shoulders. The responsibility is also held by the systems and individuals that exploit our biases, like the marketers that get us to buy overpriced stuff by using anchoring, or the media moguls that keep us in little echo chambers that are padded by our own opinions. That's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing and please consider becoming a patron. Patrons get perks. You get your name in the credits of every video if you want that. And you also get access to the videos without ads and without censorship, which is a big thing because I think going forward, I'm going to have to be censoring a lot of my videos on saucy topics a lot more, uh, judging by the latest age restrictions I've been getting on my video essays. Anyway, Thank you again. See you soon.